Killing for certain people comes easily, but for most of us, it is inexplicable. But what about when cold-blooded killers are youngsters? Some barely get started with their lives. Have you ever heard of Tyler Hadley, who planned to murder his parents for three weeks? What about John Venables and Robert Thompson, the two brothers who murdered most of their family? If you have the stomach for it, it's time to watch as we count down 15 unbelievable children that will make you cringe. No intent to ever do anything to you. I was mad one day, and that's all it was. Number 15. After enticing a youngster called James Bulger away from a shopping centre in 1993, Robert Thompson and John Venables abducted, tortured, and murdered him. The child killers were transported to a juvenile detention centre where they remained until their release in 2001 at the age of 18. At the time of their sentencing, both killers were 11 years old, making them the youngest people ever convicted of murder in England. Robert Thompson was released after serving an eight-year sentence for the heinous act and granted a new identity. He was believed to still be residing in the United Kingdom at the age of 38. In the year 2010, he was said to be in a long-term relationship with a man who was aware of his identity. Thompson is suspected of being the ringleader of the attack, even though he has not re-offended since his release. When John Venables was released at the age of 18, he was given a new identity as well. It has been altered twice since then, as he has both revealed his true name to friends and had it leaked to the public. He was sentenced to prison again in 2010 for possessing obscene photographs of youngsters. He was recalled to prison in 2017 after his parole in 2013 and is currently serving a 40-month sentence. Ralph Bulger, James's father, filed a court case in 2019 to have Venables' lifelong anonymity overturned since he had broken his restrictions by reoffending. His request was turned down because it was deemed too hazardous and would lead to vigilante assaults. Number 14. In what he imagined would be the beginning of his career as a serial killer, an 8th grade student at Southwood Middle School in Palmetto Bay, Florida, chose to murder his best friend. Michael Hernandez used his friend's faith in him to entice Jamie Goff into the boys' bathroom and into a disabled stall. He claimed he would show him something interesting. Hernandez ordered his victim to turn around after shutting the stall door because he wanted to show him a surprise. He then covered Goff's mouth with his hand and began stabbing him. Goff turned to face his assailant and pleaded with him not to kill him. Hernandez had already made up his mind about what he wanted to do. Goff had been stabbed more than 40 times. Hernandez slit the teen's throat to complete the murder. Hernandez returned to class as if nothing had happened after concealing the murder weapon in his backpack. Another student discovered Jamie Goff's body when he entered the washroom and saw him slumped over the cubicle covered in blood. Hernandez was still washing his hands in the washroom when the student inquired whether he had spotted the body, to which he replied he had, and that they should inform someone. Hernandez, on the other hand, kept quiet. The student alerted the school and authorities were summoned after a teacher discovered the body. They discovered a latex glove and a windbreaker covered in blood in Hernandez's school bag when they arrived. He was apprehended and confessed to the murder later that evening. Michael Hernandez died in prison this year due to a cardiac condition. Number 13. Before beginning on a cross-country murder spree, Robert and Michael Beaver planned to kill their family fast, like ninjas. Notoriety was the desire for the adolescent Beaver brothers. They desired articles to be written about them. They desired to be reviled. They planned to murder 500 individuals, believing that doing so would elevate them to the status of gods. On the night of July the 22nd, 2015, they pulled out knives they'd been saving and attempted to murder each of their seven other family members. When the guys went after their first victim, 13-year-old Crystal, a gory, filthy reality rapidly set in. It wasn't as it was on TV, when victims are sliced once and die. Robert grabbed his sister from behind and cut her neck after Michael led her into a bedroom under the premise of showing her something on a computer. Crystal fought back, and he stabbed her in the abdomen and arms with his knife. The boy's mother heard the noise and went upstairs. Robert greeted her with a barrage of at least 40 knife strikes, resulting in more wounds than the investigator had ever seen in any body. Crystal, on the other hand, 
crawled away to protect her younger siblings. The brothers then proceeded to the next room. Father David Beaver, 52, was stabbed 28 times and received blunt force injuries all over his body. Christopher, their seven-year-old brother, was stabbed six times. They stabbed their younger sister, Victoria, 18 times in both sides of her neck, chest, back, and upper arm when they seized her. Daniel, a 12-year-old boy, was able to shut himself in a room and dial 911. By pretending to be attacked by Robert, Michael was able to persuade his younger brother to unlock the door. The brothers barged in and stabbed the younger in the back, shoulder, and chest nine times. Robert then turned back to Crystal, who was bleeding profusely from her neck, arm, and abdomen wounds, and attempted to suffocate her. The older brother also planned to sever his two-year-old sister Autumn's head. Robert and Michael Beaver are coated in mud and blood in police images featured in Killer Siblings, and their clothes are torn and look to have chunks of flesh on them. Crystal Beaver recovered from her injuries and went on to testify against one of the brothers, who refused to accept a plea deal. Number 12. On March 17, 1984, Joshua Phillips was born. He was terrified of his own father and lived in Florida with his parents, something he admitted to in a prison interview. Phillips and his mother were reportedly affected by his father's rage. He even witnessed his father punching a hole in a wall. Maddie Clifton, his eight-year-old neighbor, vanished on November 3, 1998. Maddie, who was eight years old at the time, was reported missing at 5 p.m. The first suspect officers apprehended was a different neighbor who had been involved in sexual assault cases over the previous 15 or 20 years. Despite a failed polygraph test, the charges were dropped because his alibi was solid. Because they had no leads, the police had no choice but to end their investigation into Maddie. This did not dissuade the 400-plus volunteers who were on the lookout for the young child. A reward of $50,000 was given to anyone who could provide information regarding Maddie's whereabouts. And when that didn't, the reward was increased to $100,000. When local cops were unable to find any evidence, the FBI was called in. Phillips' mother went into his room to tidy up a week after Maddie vanished, but she noticed a strange odour. Then she saw that the waterbed on which her son slept was leaking. When she went farther into the investigation, she discovered Maddie's body. She exited the house, understandably terrified, and went across the street to Maddie's house to call the cops. The body had been shattered with a baseball bat and stabbed 11 times. When asked why he would hurt Maddie, Phillips explained that they were playing when he hit her with a baseball by accident. The ball had struck her in the eye, causing her to bleed. He began to scream and cry because of the pain. Phillips was so afraid of his father's reaction, he took her into his house, up to his room, and whacked her with a bat to get her to stop sobbing. He stabbed her to ensure she was dead before stuffing her beneath his bed when that didn't work. In 1999, the 14-year-old was tried as an adult and given a life sentence. Number 11. Kenzie Hook was eight months pregnant when she was shot in the back of the head at her Western Pennsylvania farmhouse while resting in bed. As a result of the attack, both she and her unborn child died. Jordan Brown was 11 years old when he was arrested for the shotgun killing of Kenzie Hook, 26, and her unborn child in New Beaver in 2009. When Pennsylvania's Supreme Court rejected his case in 2018, he was almost 21 years old. Prosecutors had not produced enough evidence to secure a conviction. It was claimed that the evidence presented to prosecutors was improperly obtained, mischaracterized, or invented to support a theory that the 11-year-old had committed the murder, something he would have had to perform and clean up in less than 120 seconds. Investigators only recorded the fourth interview with Hook's then seven-year-old daughter. According to the lawsuit, the girl stated in her first interview that she had not heard or seen anything peculiar. After authorities told her grandparents that Brown killed Hook, the girl said she saw him with firearms that morning and heard a bang in a subsequent interview. Brown could have received a life sentence without the possibility of parole if he had been tried and convicted of murder as an adult. But because he was only 11 at the time of the incident, he was placed in a secure juvenile prison until he turned 21. He was granted the right to have his case transferred to a juvenile court. Number 10. Eric M. Smith, a child killer, has been denied parole for the 10th time. 
Smith, who was sentenced to life in prison in August 1993 after killing four-year-old Derek Roby in Steuben, appeared before the parole board for the first time since 2018. Smith, who recently turned 40, is being held at a medium security facility. He's been behind bars since 1994. Roby was enticed into a wooded area near the boy's Savona home by Smith, who was 13 at the time. Derek was walking alone to a nearby park for a summer camp. Derek was strangled, smashed in the head with a rock, then sodomized with a stick by Smith. Smith had previously told a parole board that he'd been holding a lot of rage inside following years of bullying. At his 2014 parole hearing, Smith argued that the victim didn't deserve what he did to him and that no one deserved such violence. He was cruel in his treatment of him. Smith maintained in 2014 that he took out his frustrations, wrath and rage on him, explaining that the sentiments weren't directed at Derek, but rather at his father, elder sister and high school bullies. He took his frustrations out on Derek, who did not deserve it. Smith was held in a juvenile detention center until 2001, when he was sent to a state jail. Smith's counsel attempted to persuade a jury that Smith had a mental illness at the time of his trial, but Smith was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to nine years to life in prison. Number nine, Graham Frederick Young, also known as the Teacup Poisoner and later the St. Albans Poisoner, was a serial killer in England who killed his victims with poison. Young began poisoning relatives and school acquaintances by lacing their food and drinks with thallium and antimony when he was a child, resulting in the death of his stepmother. At the age of 14, he was detained in Broadmoor Hospital in 1962. He was released in 1971 and went to work as a tea boy in a factory, where he poisoned his co-workers, resulting in two further deaths. Young was found guilty of two murders and sentenced to life in prison in 1972. In 1990, he died in prison. Number 8. On January 29, 1979, in a public elementary school in San Diego, California, a shooting occurred. Eight children and police officer Robert Robb were killed, along with a school principal and a custodian. Brenda Spencer, a 16-year-old girl who lived across the street from the school, was found guilty of the shootings. She was charged as an adult and pled guilty to two counts of murder and assault with a dangerous weapon, receiving a life sentence with a chance of parole after 25 years. She was still in prison as of August 2021. In September 2022, she will be eligible for parole. Spencer, now 57, has been welcomed into the Golden Girls Club at the California Institute for Women, a program at the 1800 Prisoner Facility in Riverside County, California, that grants special privileges to individuals who join willingly once they reach the age of 55. Spencer benefits from several privileges not available to the public. Number 7. Edmund Kemper, sometimes known as the co-ed killer, brutally murdered at least 10 individuals in California throughout the 1960s and 1970s. The warning indicators were there from the start. Edmund Kemper used to slaughter animals, decapitate his sister's dolls, and make up horrific games when he was a kid. He even assassinated his grandparents when he was 15 years old. The police didn't believe Kemper at first when he confessed to killing six female hitchhikers, as well as his mother and her best friend. They were familiar with and liked Big Ed, a six foot nine man who appeared to be a gentle giant. He was far from it. Kemper was a ruthless serial killer who raped corpses, dismembered bodies and buried the heads of his victims in his lawn. His high IQ of 145 made him even more deadly as he exploited it to get away from his crime sites unnoticed. Edmund Kemper, despite the crimes he committed, only spent a few years in the hospital. He was liberated on his 21st birthday in 1969. Kemper then moved in with his mother, who worked as an administrative assistant at the University of California, Santa Cruz at the time. Number six. Tyler Hadley had been telling everyone at school all week how he was planning a party. Nobody believed him when he told his parents were going to be out of town. Tyler messaged his friend Antonio on July 16th, 2011, a Saturday, indicating he was trying to throw another party. Tyler took a few ecstasy pills at 5 p.m. He immediately went after his mother, who was working on their computer. With a hammer, he murdered her. His father came out to see what Tyler had done after hearing his wife's screams. 
Tyler then murdered his father. He hid their bodies in the master bedroom after cleaning up the blood. Tyler then threw a party for his friends. Around 11.30pm, a few students from Tyler's school arrived, and the party began. A few individuals spotted a red-brown crusted stain near the computer while they were listening to music, and one even quipped the place smelled like dead people. Several people began to notice a strange sweaty odour and stains throughout the property. Tyler did reveal the truth to one person that night. Michael Mandel, his best buddy. Michael was not convinced. Tyler advised him to check the garage. The cops arrived at 2am, only to investigate a noise complaint. Tyler was acting strangely at that moment, and he demanded that everyone leave his residence. He was also informing folks he was throwing another party. The cops walked up to the locked master bedroom and forced it open. Tyler was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of release in 2014 because he was 17 at the time and could not be sentenced to death. Number 5. Six students were shot on February 27, 2012 at Chardon High School in Chardon, Ohio, with three of them dying. According to witnesses, the shooter had a personal feud with one of his victims. Two more injured kids were taken to the hospital. One of them suffered several critical injuries that rendered him permanently paralysed. A small injury was sustained by the fifth student, and a superficial wound was sustained by the sixth. Authorities revealed the culprit was Thomas M. T.J. Lane III, a 17-year-old male juvenile and former Chardon student who was a sophomore at Lake Academy Alternative School and shared a bus with numerous victims. Lane used a handgun with a .22 caliber. Lane was apprehended by police not far from his automobile, which was parked outside the school and charged with three charges of aggravated murder, two counts of aggravated attempted murder, and one count of felonious assault after being indicted. He was imprisoned as a juvenile due to his age, pending a decision by the prosecution and the court on whether he would be tried as an adult. In May 2012, a judge found that Lane was competent to stand trial after a competency hearing. It was decided later that month to charge Lane as an adult. On March 19, 2013, he pled guilty and was sentenced to three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 4. Kipland Philip Kip Kinkle was a Springfield, Oregon-based school shooter. He killed his parents at home with a rifle on May 21, 1998 and then went to Thurston High School. He opened fire there, killing two students and injuring another 25. He is currently serving a life sentence without the possibility of release. Kip Kinkle was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia at the time of the shooting, according to several psychiatrists. Kinkle killed his father by shooting him in the head, right above the ear, using a Ruger .22 caliber semi-automatic rifle he owned. Kinkle shot him in the back, then pulled him into the bathroom and covered him with a white sheet. Kinkle then sat in the living room, waiting for his mother to return. Faith Kinkle arrived at her house and Kinkle went to the basement, where the garage was, to assist her with the luggage. He shot her on the basement steps. Kinkle held a gun to his head that night but was unable to kill himself. Kinkle drove his mother's automobile to school the next day. He wore a trench coat and a pair of slacks. Kinkle fired 50 shots at students in the cafeteria and on the terrace area. He hit a total of 34 students, killing two of them. Kinkle pleaded guilty to murder and attempted murder on September 24, 1999, three days before jury selection was to begin, foregoing the possibility of being convicted due to insanity. Kinkle was sentenced to more than 111 years in jail without the chance of parole in November 1999. Kinkle apologised to the court for the murder of his parents and the shooting spree during his sentencing. Number 3. Lionel Alexander Tate is the youngest person ever convicted to life in prison without the possibility of parole in the United States. Tate was convicted of first-degree murder for the 1998 battering to death of six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch when he was 14 years old. Tate was left alone with Eunuch, who was being babysat upstairs by Tate's mother, Kathleen Grosset Tate. Tate's defense claimed that the then 12-year-old 166-pound boy was playing with a six-year-old 46-pound girl when he inadvertently murdered her while teaching her professional wrestling manoeuvres he'd seen on TV. Tate was found guilty of murdering Eunuch by stomping on her, with such force that her liver was lacerated. A cracked skull, a fractured rib, 
and a swollen brain were among her other ailments. The prosecution described her injuries as equivalent to those she would have incurred if she had fallen from a three-story building. The conduct of Lionel Tate were not the playful activities of a child. Judge Joel T. Lazarus of Browden County Circuit Court declared in sentencing Tate to life in prison. Lionel Tate's actions were callous, heartless, and indescribably wicked. Number two, Christian Fernandez, who was 12 when he killed his two-year-old brother, but will be released from a juvenile detention center on his 19th birthday. For the beating to death of his two-year-old half-brother, David Galarraga, Fernandez was charged with first-degree murder. Fernandez was indicted by a grand jury and then state attorney Angela Corey believed his case should be handled in adult court. Fernandez's case and Corey's filing decision immediately became international news. A group of Jacksonville attorneys intervened on the boy's behalf and Fernandez eventually pled guilty to lesser charges of murder and aggravated violence in February 2013, receiving juvenile punishments as part of the deal. He was supposed to be confined to a Department of Juvenile Justice secure institution and not to be released until he turned 19 years old. He was required to get a high school diploma or the equivalent while incarcerated, and following his release, he would be on probation for eight years. However, for good behavior, it may be determined as soon as five years after. Number one, Dylan Schumacher is most well known for a video of him crying in court that went viral. But the reason he was there should be the emphasis. Dylan Schumacher was left alone with his girlfriend's little infant, who died at the end of the night. When the child would not stop weeping, Shoemaker would allegedly beat him to death, according to court documents. Dylan Shoemaker would be apprehended and convicted of the murder as well as counts of child abuse. He allegedly informed the guards they should watch the performance he was going to put on in the courtroom when he was about to be sentenced. The rest, as they say, is history. For the murder, this young killer received a sentence of 25 years to life in jail. He stated in court that he had no intention of harming the youngster. Dylan Shoemaker was found guilty of second-degree murder by a jury that did not believe him and was condemned to the maximum penalty of 25 years to life in prison. During his trial, Dylan Shoemaker told the jury that when Austin spat out his food and used an obscenity, he smacked his face and spanked him. He further admitted that while changing the kid's diaper, he banged his head on the floor as the child attempted to stand up and that afterwards, he put a pillow over the back of his head and hit it three times because he was scared the boy would wake his baby brother. He stated that this was only the second time he cared for both boys. I must say I'm flabbergasted by the atrocities of these crimes. No crime is right, but when kids so young commit such crimes, it confirms there is something seriously wrong with our society. I don't have any favorites, and neither should you. Why don't you let us know in the comments below what you think of these crimes? Well, that's our countdown of 15 unbelievable evil children that will make you cringe. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and let us know in the comments what you think. Check out our other videos and subscribe. Click on the notification icon so you can see our new videos as soon as they're uploaded. That's it for now.